An unusual scene overseas tonight in London. The London Bridge stuck in an upright position for hours, completely snarling traffic in one of the busiest areas in the city. The bridge was open to allow a large wooden ship to go underneath. Authorities say a technical failure is to blame. The historic bridge, built in 1894, normally opens about 800 times every year. Code red for humanity. The dire warning tonight from the United Nations as it releases its once in a decade climate report. The conclusions impossible to ignore. Humans are to blame for our warming planet and making disasters like the wildfires in Greece and California even worse. Our Maggie Ruley is in Greece tonight. You can hear the crackle of these flames. The fires are just ripping through the underbrush here. Look at that. We see it climbing up that tree and going all the way up the hillside. But also the report making it very clear it's not too late to reverse course. One of the UN's leading voices on climate change standing by to join us live. COVID cases are soaring in the United States for the fourth day in a row, 100,000 new cases a day. And tonight, the concerning rise in cases among children. Tonight, pediatricians are urging the government to let children from 5 to 12 get the vaccine. Many hospitals are nearing a breaking point tonight, overwhelmed with patients. Florida is asking the federal government for hundreds of ventilators. The Pentagon weighing in tonight about the Taliban's advance in Afghanistan, saying things are clearly not headed in the right direction. What can the U.S. do to help as it prepares to leave Afghanistan in just a matter of weeks? The major developments in Washington this weekend that set the stage for an infrastructure compromise. The Senate expected to pass a bipartisan bill tomorrow morning, sending it to the House for a new battle, possibly pitting Democrats against each other. What comes next? The U.S. Energy Secretary joins us. This will be the biggest investment in making sure that we have clean energy in, of course, our nation's history. Not one, not two, but 39 golds. The hometown heroes returning from Tokyo with the Olympics now in the books. How did Team USA compare to the competition? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. A code red for humanity. Tonight, we begin with the wake-up call from the United Nations on what they call the unequivocal impact humans are having on our planet. Their once-in-a-decade climate report is out today, and with it comes a warning about what could happen if humans do not aggressively change. It's the world's most expansive report yet into climate change, and there's no sugarcoating it. The UN report says at this point, we are not able to stop global warming for at least 30 years. Essentially, a hotter future is already locked in. A future where extreme weather events like devastating fires, historic flooding, and extreme heat are all more common. The report's authors are essentially sending the world's leaders a final wake-up call, curb emissions and dramatically reduce consumption or face a world that is fundamentally different. Around the world, fire crews are battling fires tonight on a nearly unprecedented scale. If seeing is believing, many are getting a first-hand look at a worst-case scenario for the future. But the report concludes there is still time to change. Our Maggie Ruley reports from Greece. Code red for humanity. A dire warning tonight from the United Nations about our planet's future. Scenes more reminiscent of horror movies now playing out right before our eyes. Very, very problem. My island is on fire. This is Greece in 2021. Turkey, California, China, Germany. A brand new once in a decade report from the UN is incredibly clear. We are altering our planet. The report detailing how climate change is making extreme weather worse in every region of the globe. Hotter heat waves, heavier rain, more extreme droughts, raging infernos. You can hear the crackle of these flames. The fires are just ripping through the underbrush here. Look at that. We see it climbing up that tree. It is going all the way up the hillside. We have seen dozens of these hot spots popping up along the road. This is what firefighters are struggling to keep up with. Here in Greece, the fire is turning the sky a bloodshot, ominous red, forcing residents out of the Greek island of Evia, making conditions all the more difficult for the crews desperately trying to help them to safety. My heart cries. I leave my family behind. The Greek wildfires have been raging for more than a week. Neighboring Turkey finally got most of their fires under control after nearly two weeks, killing at least eight. And it's all across our globe, extreme weather of seemingly biblical proportions, now a painful new normal. Firefighters had been working in this area just a few days ago, but they've already moved on to other areas now 
You can see obviously the fire is starting again here. There are at least 93 active wildfires burning in Siberia. Over 2.8 million acres destroyed. Some villages in the region evacuated. In America's West, record heat, drought, and strong winds feeding blazes like the Dixie Fire up in Northern California. Now, the largest singular fire in the state's history. It's a leveled ghost town out here. The surrounding areas still threatened. The air difficult to breathe because of the multiple hazards. Officials say could be weeks before families are allowed to return. The eight largest fires in California have all occurred in the past four years. Unprecedented 116 degree heat in the Pacific Northwest and all time record highs in Canada, causing hundreds of deaths earlier this summer. And if it's not record heat and fires, it's flooding. Yet again, Venice's iconic St. Mark's Square covered in water far earlier in the year than normal. These horrifying scenes from China, commuters trapped in chest deep water and train cars, streets transformed into rivers after record rainfall in the center of the country. How high was the water up to here? Uh, that's right here. I was in Germany just three weeks ago, the site of devastating floods after a once in 1,000 year rainstorm killed at least 160 people. There's so many people dead. You don't expect people to die in a flood in Germany. Buildings in this medieval town around since before the 15th century were once thought to be able to stand the test of time, now potentially destroyed by one flood. From floods that wipe out entire towns to fires that leave forests and homes burned, covered in ash, still smoldering. These extreme once in a lifetime unprecedented events are now becoming common and scientists all point to one thing, climate change. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme weather events more frequent and severe. Second, it shows that climate change is affecting every region on our planet. The UN's report confirming in the strongest language ever that the world is warming at a rate unprecedented in the last 2,000 years. And the report says we, humans, are to blame. Our actions have us at the breaking point, even if we meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The number 1.5 degrees Celsius, there was this Ideally, from the Paris Agreement, we would try to keep warming below that level. That looks like a pretty big challenge at this point. Some impacts of climate change are now irreversible. Our behavior has altered our oceans, changed our planet's glaciers. In Greenland, the amount of ice that melted in the space of one day in July could cover the entire state of Florida in two inches of water. And no matter what we do, the ice melt is going to continue and get worse. Changes in ice sheets, deep ocean temperature, and acidification will continue for centuries to thousands of years, meaning that they are irreversible in our lifetime and will continue for generations to come. The report concluding sea level rise may be one of the single biggest problems for the rest of the 21st century. Even if you suddenly like stop the increase in warming, you're going to see, still see melting for decades to come. What's different about this report? Well, just how confident scientists are about the conclusions. So this report was produced by over 200 scientists from 65 countries. Um, they worked for three years together to uh, assess huge amounts of scientific information, over 14,000 studies and research papers. Data from the past eight years has the scientific community more confident than ever before that humans are the cause of what's happening to our planet. But it doesn't have to be this way. While more warming is expected in the coming decades, it's not too late to change trends if humanity changes behaviors now. We can't undo the mistakes of the past. This generation can make the systemic changes that will stop the planet warming, help everyone adapt to the new conditions, and create a world of peace, prosperity, and equity. Climate change is here now, but we are also here now. And if we don't act, who will? 
A call to action tonight from the United Nations. Maggie Ruley joins us now from Greece. And Maggie, as we saw in your piece, you've been in two disaster zones just in the past few weeks there in Greece. And of course, the flooding in Germany, these extreme weather events taking such an emotional toll on these communities. How are people that you're, you're talking to responding to it all? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, emotional is the perfect word to describe it. No matter where we are, we always hear the same thing. People tell us they're exhausted, they're angry, and they're scared. Uh, here in Greece, people are tired. They're exhausted. The fires here on this island alone have been going on for more than seven days. You know, we're talking about these extreme once-in-a-lifetime events that, Lindsay, now seem to be happening at least once a summer, and they're lasting for longer than ever. I mean, you talk about just the toll that takes on someone, because all of this is so personal and we heard from that one young man who said my island is on fire you know these fires are burning through people's homes these uh, ferries and and bus and uh, uh, boats behind me they are all on standby waiting if someone needs to be evacuated from their home tonight that takes a toll and when we were in Germany I'll never forget standing in front of uh, this makeshift garbage pile it was the size of a football field two stories high and it was filled with people's ruined belongings everything that they cherish this is personal and people People just get exhausted of it and then soon they become angry so many people always tell us uh, they're angry their governments haven't done more they should have known this was coming we've been talking about climate change we get natural disasters why weren't they prepared and they're demanding that governments step in and, and do more because this is going to keep happening and that's why people are scared they're scared for the future you know we just saw that, that UN climate report saying these types of natural disasters are happening and they're gonna happen more often Often. That medieval town in Germany with houses that have been around before the 15th century, you know, one man told us he can't believe his house it might be ruined. How is he ever going to come back? Are those people going to rebuild if there's going to get more floods? Uh, people here in Greece with Athens experiencing temperatures 113 degrees. I mean, how long is that livable for? Are people going to be able to live in these cities and these countries any longer? You know, Lindsay, I think we all know this was coming, but many people thought it was going to be centuries or at least decades in the future. But for places like Germany, for places like Greece, for places in America, all of this is happening right now, Lindsay. Right. I, I, the urgency, I think, has been lost on, on so many of us. But, of course, the fear and frustration, understandable. Maggie, thank you so much for your reporting. And joining us now is a special advisor and assistant secretary general for climate action at the United Nations, Selwyn Hart. Thank you so much for your time tonight. The U.N. secretary general was clear. The U.N. climate report out today is a, quote, code red for humanity. The report did still say that there is time to avoid a worst case scenario, but we are locked into 30 years of worsening climate impacts no matter what. So what does success look like at this point? Well, Thank you so much for having me this evening. And it's definitely a code red for humanity. The evidence mutable greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning and deforestation choking our planet and placing the lives of billions of people at risk. Now is not the time for delay. Now is not the time for excuses. This is why this year's climate summit in Glasgow Scotland this year represents a critical milestone for global efforts to address and defeat climate change. We need all leaders, all countries to step up to the plate. As I said before, now is not the time for excuses or delayed action. We need to see bold actions from all governments, rich countries, poor countries, big countries, and small countries to reduce emissions drastically. As the science says, the science says that we must have global emissions over the course of the next decade. It is possible. We have the technologies. We have the resources to do it. At the same time, we're seeing these unprecedented impacts in the United States, but also in small and poor developing countries. Countries don't have the means and the capacity to respond to the massive impacts of climate change. In addition to reducing emissions, governments and the international community must invest in resilience building to support vulnerable peoples and vulnerable communities. So if there's one bar for success, if we could be really specific, something that we can measure 10 years from now and say, okay, that worked, what would that one thing be? 
decarbonizing the energy sector. It's absolutely essential that we decarbonize the energy sector, sector as quickly as possible. And we have the technologies available. We simply need to triple electricity generation from renewable sources over the course of the next decade or so. And it has been done before. Between 2010 and 2020, power generation from renewable energy sources, wind and solar in particular, triple. We need to do this again, but at a much grander scale. And we must consign fuels like coal to the dustbin. We cannot, the single greatest step that must be taken to, um, to keep this 1.5 degree goal within reach is to phase out coal. And this must be a key objective of the global, of the Glasgow conference. What's the worst case scenario if the world does not heed the warnings laid out in this report? Well, um, it will be a planet that is unlivable. Uh, as the report clearly indicates, lives of billions of people are at stake. We cannot survive in a four degree world or a three degree world. Warming has increased by about 1.2 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. And we're seeing these unprecedented impacts in all countries, every continent. We, a worst case scenario will be billions of lives. I, 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 we really can't think of a worst case scenario. I think all global efforts now need to be focused on how do we our children. You know, I guess my question would really be to follow up there is, do you think that global action is not just feasible, but realistic? Is it your expectation that these world leaders are going to take the necessary action? Yes, yes. We're cautiously optimistic. And over the course of the last few months or so, we've seen many governments committing to net zero by mid-century, about 73% of total global greenhouse gas emissions are now covered by a net zero commitment. We've seen the entire G7 group of nations commit to net zero by 2050. We've also seen many other large economies also making this commitment. But we need all of the G20 nations. These nations account for about 80% of global emissions. We need all of these countries to commit to net zero as a first step, but also back up this long-term commitment with ambitious interim targets. And again, at the recent G7 summit in, um, in the United Kingdom, we saw all of the G7 countries step up with more ambitious, what are called national climate plans or nationally determined contributions. But we need all countries to be more ambitious, to use this next decade. What happens, we will win or lose this race over the course of the next decade if we don't reduce emissions, if we don't have emissions by the end of this decade, we will have no hope of beating the 1.5 goal of the Paris Agreement. It seems so soon. Um, and lastly, I know that you were just saying that you need all of the G20 countries to participate, but let's point out in particular the United States. It feels like we would need to play an extremely large role in all of that. What's your message to President Biden and our own country's leaders? Well, President Biden has taken some extraordinary steps over the course of the last few months. He has increased the U.S.'s commitment to climate action. He's convened global leaders, and we need President Biden to continue to display that global leadership, um, amazing global leadership. We also need all large countries, all of the G20 countries, to follow this type of example. And we also need wealthy countries to not forget that they need to support resilience building and adaptation in the smaller and poor countries. This must be a global effort. It must be a moment for global solidarity. Many of the impacts that you're seeing in the United States, in Greece, and other parts of Europe are being seen in small island nations. They're being seen in Africa. Warming in Africa is occurring 
much greater at much greater levels than the global average. So in addition to reducing emissions domestically, countries like the United, like the United States must also reach out and support the smaller and poor nations who are already battling with many of these devastating impacts from climate change. And that's what the Glasgow Conference is about. It's about looking at this issue from a compre through a comprehensive lens. We must reduce global emissions, but we must also protect vulnerable people and vulnerable communities in every corner of the earth. Special Advisor and Assistant Secretary General for Climate Action at the United Nations, Selwyn Hart, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Always a pleasure. Now to the alarming surge in COVID cases in nearly all 50 states, numbers not seen in roughly six months, including cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. The U.S. is reporting more than 100,000 cases for four straight days now. The vast majority of these cases are among the unvaccinated. The virus fueled by the Delta variant now targeting children by the thousands. Our Victor Akendo reports from Florida tonight where hospitals are at the brink. Tonight, the COVID crisis is exploding across the South. From Florida to Louisiana to Texas, hospitals are putting up surge tents, bringing in extra ventilators and running out of beds and staff. When you overrun us and you wear us down and we get to where we can't come to work anymore, that's not going to be anybody here to take care of you. With 68,000 COVID patients straining American hospitals, experts warn the system in affected communities is nearing the breaking point. If this pace continues for the next four or five days, uh, which it seems it will, the hospital systems in Florida and Louisiana will collapse. And with COVID infections climbing, another move to mandate vaccines. The Pentagon today announcing it will seek the president's approval to require nearly 1.4 million active duty military members to get the vaccine starting in mid-September. You can consider this memo today as what we would call in the military a warning order. And the Pentagon could move that deadline up if the vaccines get full FDA approval sooner. Tonight, with millions of school children heading back to the classroom, doctors fear more kids will be hospitalized with COVID. You should assume that we're going to see uh, pediatric intensive care units all across the South completely overwhelmed and something even a possibility of uh, tent, small tent cities of, of sick adolescents and kids. In just the last week, pediatric cases climbing to 94,000 and children with COVID are going into hospitals at a rate nearly four times higher than just a month ago. This is not your grandfather's COVID. Children are experiencing more d severe disease than they have in the past. They come in in respiratory failure. They often require hospitalization in the pediatric intensive care unit. The Delta surge prompting the American Academy of Pediatrics to call on the FDA to authorize vaccines for 5 to 11 year olds as fast as possible. In Virginia, 17-year-old Shwanda Corpru died just four days before she was scheduled to get the vaccine. I don't want to see anybody else have to bury, you know, their little sibling or little daughter or anything like that. It's really heartbreaking. In Jacksonville, Florida, 12-year-old Lila Hartley wants masks in schools to protect her 10-year-old brother who's too young to get the vaccine. Even though I'm vaccinated, I can still get sick. Also, my, my younger brother will... I don't want to get him sick if I get it because I wasn't wearing a mask. So much of the concern right now for the children in particular. Victor Akendo joins us now. Victor, we've heard about hospital beds running out in Austin, Texas, just six ICU beds for more than two million people there. And we're hearing that that's not the only state where that's the case. Lindsay, the governor of Arkansas, saying that they just saw their largest single-day increase in hospitalizations now down to just eight ICU beds in a state of three million people. Governor Hutchinson calling it an heir to sign a law banning those mask mandates. Lindsay? Victor Kendo, our thanks to you. Now to the latest developments with embattled New York Governor Andrew Cuomo as state lawmakers discuss possible impeachment proceedings after that scathing report accusing him of sexual harassment involving 11 women. One of those accusers is now speaking out for the first time about her allegations and also filing a criminal complaint. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef in Albany. 
Tonight, embattled New York Governor Andrew Cuomo now fighting to salvage his political career. For the first time in more than 100 years, the Assembly is undertaking an impeachment investigation of a sitting governor. Today, the New York Assembly Judiciary Committee meeting for the first time since the searing New York Attorney General's report found Cuomo sexually harassed 11 women. The Assembly's impeachment investigation looking into additional allegations of misconduct. Allegations that the governor improperly used state resources to write and produce a book. Allegations concerning COVID-19 and nursing homes. Allegations that he provided for preferential access to COVID-19 testing. And Governor Cuomo also facing potential misdemeanor charges in Albany, stemming from a criminal complaint filed by his former executive assistant, Brittany Camisso. He put his hand up my blouse and cupped my breast over my bra. The governor has maintained he never touched anyone inappropriately. With respect to Brittany Camiso, it just did not happen. Ariel Reshev joins us now again from Albany. And Ariel, we also got word last night of a top aide to Governor Cuomo resigning. What can you tell us about that? That's right, Lindsay. It's hard to overstate just how significant this is. Melissa DeRosa, the governor's top aide, suddenly resigning overnight less than a week after that bombshell report was released. You may remember and our viewers may remember that she was sitting next to the governor during those infamous COVID-19 briefings. They gained him so much notoriety, really one of his closest in his inner circle. Now she has resigned, citing an emotionally and mentally trying two years. Lindsay. And what are we learning about the Judiciary Committee's timeline for their impeachment investigation and how that might work. Well, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee today, Lindsay, said that that investigation should wrap up by the end of August. And should they decide to file articles of impeachment, those proceedings would start in early September. If the governor is impeached, and we're a ways away from that, but if the governor is impeached, he would have to step down until the end of that trial. Lindsay. Ariel Reshef, our thanks to you. It was just last week that we reported on the first province in Afghanistan falling under Taliban control. Well, just in days, the situation has escalated with that group now seizing control of at least six key cities. Stephanie Ramos has the latest on the Taliban gains and why even the Pentagon is admitting that things in that nation clearly are not headed in the right direction. Tonight, the situation in Afghanistan deteriorating quickly. The Taliban taking control of two more provincial capitals just today, bringing the total to six. The Afghan Ministry of Defense releasing video of airstrikes against Taliban positions. But the Taliban's takeover has been swift. In just the past five months, the group seizing wide swaths of the country. And now, a growing humanitarian crisis for Afghan children. At least 27 killed and 136 injured since Friday. The Pentagon saying today the situation is clearly not going in the right direction. However, the secretary continues to believe uh, that the Afghan forces have the capability, they have the capacity to make a big difference on the battlefield. With the full U.S. withdrawal just weeks away, the Afghan government clearly struggling to make that difference. Lindsay, the U.S. military says 95% of U.S. troops and equipment have withdrawn, and the withdrawal will continue the next few weeks ahead. However, about 650 U.S. troops will remain on the ground to help protect the U.S. Embassy and the airport. The U.S. is also providing critical air support to Afghan forces. That is scheduled to end later this month. Lindsay. As President Biden moves one step closer to the passage of his trillion dollar infrastructure plan with the Senate expected to pass that bipartisan bill tomorrow, what happens next? Let's bring in ABC congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Rachel, this bill finally making it through the Senate, but, but where does it stand on getting through the House? Yeah, a rare moment of bipartisanship in the Senate, but it still does have a very long way to go over in the House, Lindsay. The House is already on recess, and Democrats hold a razor-thin majority. They can really only afford to lose four votes here. Progressive Democrats have said that this is not big enough. They want to see their party pass a much larger package. The measure they're eyeing right now, Lindsay, $3.5 trillion. And yes, as you mentioned, that $3.5 trillion budget bill unveiled by Democrats today. Just outline the scope of this bill and whether Democrats have the votes to actually move it forward. 
Yeah, so this is a very sweeping measure, Lindsay, and it really includes several Democratic priorities. And a lot of Democrats say that this goes hand in hand. So you're going to see in this measure funding for universal pre-K as well as free community college, billions more to fight climate change. The issue here is that Democrats are going to have to pass this on their own in the Senate, which means that they cannot afford to lose a single vote. And you already have moderate Democratic senators looking at that price tag and saying that it's just too high, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. We turn now to the Biden administration's Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You bet. Happy to be on. The $1.1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill makes major investments in areas like clean energy and electric vehicle infrastructure. And there are also additional climate-related measures in the $3.5 trillion budget bill Democrats unveiled today. But as we reported earlier, the U.N. climate report today called the threat from warming temperatures a code red for humanity. So let me first ask, do these bills go far enough to address that threat? Well, together they go a significant way, um, and it's not just the United States. Obviously, other countries have to work, too. This will be the biggest investment in making sure that we have clean energy in, of course, our nation's history. It is very significant. We have to do it. Uh, the report today suggested, not just suggested, really had a flashing light saying this has been, this is far too um, big of a problem for one country to address. Everybody has to do do it. It is persistent. It's gone uh, on too long, and we can still fix it, but we've got to make big and bold moves, and that's what the Biden administration is proposing. And as you know, progressives have argued that the bipartisan infrastructure bill falls far short of the major spending needed to address the threat from climate change. And, and some have said that they may not be on board unless the bigger spending bill can also pass. So are you confident that the smaller bipartisan infrastructure bill will get enough votes in the House? I believe it will. I believe people understand the importance of this two-step process. The bipartisan bill makes significant investments in, for example, uh, making sure that we have an electrified transportation system by ensuring that we've got charging stations on our nation's highways and in places that the private sector hasn't established them yet. Very important. And it also makes big investments in our nation's grid, which is really critical if we're going to add all the clean energy, the renewable energy that we need to add. We need to expand the capacity and the resilience of our grid. And at the same time, the Biden administration does not currently have the support of 50 Democratic senators for this larger $3.5 trillion budget bill, with Senators Manchin and Cinema stating multiple times that the price tag is just too high right now. What do you think that the Biden administration can do in order to convince them to back that additional spending package? Well, obviously, this is going to be a negotiation, and they've got their priorities. But I can tell you, in my lane, I mean, Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema both are seeing the impacts of this uh, of climate change in their states big time. I mean, Arizona, obviously, massive uh, drought, huge heat wave. And in West Virginia, there has been a history and a legacy of fossil fuel workers that are seeing their jobs go away as a result of the globe moving to cleaner energy. Both of them know the importance of investment and incentivizing clean energy, and that's a, such a big part of the second step, this reconciliation package. And beyond the measures in these bills, what's the top priority for you as Energy Secretary to move the U.S. toward addressing the global threat from climate change outlined in the U.N. report? I know a moment ago you said that there's still time to fix it, but is there any concern at all that, that we're really running out of time? Yeah, for sure there is. Our hair should be on fire. This is really, I mean, the planet's on fire. Certainly the West is on fire. Yeah, we have, a, we have this deep sense of urgency. And so my top three priorities are deploy, deploy, deploy. Deploy the clean energy technologies that we already have, the wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, nuclear. Deploy, deploy, deploy. And then also invest in the future, the kinds of technologies that we know are going to be necessary to take us the rest of the way home. So bottom line is, for us, I mean, the Department of Energy is the Department of Solutions, really. We have 17 national labs that are working on the solutions to climate change, but we also have technology that is ready to go, and deployment is critical. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, we thank you so much for your time. You bet.
Coast. When we come back, the friends in an elevator when flood waters start pouring in, we'll explain what happened there. Our conversation with the director of the new documentary, Pray Away, and someone who went through these controversial conversion therapies, what they want the world to know. But up next, the lawsuit filed against Britain's Prince Andrew and its connection to the Jeffrey Epstein investigation. Stay with us. Next to the breaking news involving Prince Andrew, he is now facing a new lawsuit filed by Jeffrey Epstein's accuser, Virginia Jufre. Here's ABC's Janae Norman. Tonight, Prince Andrew facing a new lawsuit filed by Jeffrey Epstein accuser Virginia Roberts Jufre, claiming the prince sexually abused her when she was 17. In the lawsuit, Jufre stating, 20 years ago, Prince Andrew's wealth, power, position, and connections enabled him to abuse a frightened, vulnerable child with no one there to protect her. Regardless of how rich and powerful they may be, they are not above the law. In court filings beginning in 2014, Jufre says Epstein and longtime associate Ghislaine Maxwell allegedly directed her to have sex with Prince Andrew on three occasions in 2001. Included in the filings, this photograph of Jufre standing beside the prince. In a rare interview with the BBC in November 2019, the prince denied her accusations. You don't remember meeting her? No. Nobody can prove uh, whether or not it, um, that, it, that photograph has been doctored, but I don't recollect that photograph ever being taken. The filing comes nearly two years after Epstein died in a New York jail. Andrew has not commented on the filing today. And as for Ghislaine Maxwell, she has pleaded not guilty to federal charges. She conspired with Epstein and aided in his alleged sexual abuse of four underage girls from 1994 to 2004. Her trial is set to begin in November. Lindsay. Janae, thank you. Still ahead here on Prime, Canada's borders are back open to Americans, but with one very big catch. The warning tonight from the CDC about a rare bacterial disease that has been identified in four states. And the 2021 Olympic Games are now over. Over. We'll take a look at the highlights by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day from the Cincinnati Zoo. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. She wanted to be a star. She wanted to be a mother. And Danny Lynn is her legacy. And to be really honest, I didn't know a whole lot about Anna, you know, her early years. I thought, why not go back to Anna's beginnings? You don't own me. What happens when her family goes in search for Anna, her possessions, her secrets, and why no one called 911 sooner is never fully answered. When the autopsy is released, it is shocking. The 2020 event special, Friday on ABC. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The Summer Games in Tokyo have come to a close, and on the last day of competition, Team USA pulled ahead in the final medal count. Let's take a look by the numbers. The U.S. finished with 39 gold medals, edging out China by one gold overall. Host country Japan finished third with 27 gold medals. Team USA's 113 total medals, including 41 silver and 33 bronze, also put them on top of the medal standings overall. China finished in second, 25 medals behind the U.S. and the Russian. Olympic Committee came in third. 
some of the most notable American achievements. U.S. swimmer Caleb Dressel took home five gold medals, the most of any athlete in Tokyo, and he set two new world records in the process. Competing in her fifth Olympics, 35-year-old Allison Felix won her 11th medal with a gold in the 4 by 400 relay this weekend. That makes her the most decorated U.S. track and field Olympian ever, one ahead of Carl Lewis. And Team USA's women's basketball team, they took home their seventh gold medal in a row dating back to 1996, with teammates Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird each winning their fifth gold medal with the team that's the most ever by Olympic basketball players. These summer games, of course, came after a one-year delay due to the pandemic, so that means there are only 179 days until the next Olympic Games this winter, set to kick off in Beijing in February 2022. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The trial against singer-songwriter R. Kelly has begun. We have the details on that. And our conversation with a woman who underwent gay conversion therapy and is now speaking out against it. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. crisis is exploding across the South. When you overrun us and you wear us down and we get to where we can't come to work anymore, that's not going to be anybody here to take care of you. With 68,000 COVID patients straining American hospitals, experts warn the system in affected communities is nearing the breaking point. Tonight, with millions of school children heading back to the classroom, doctors fear more kids will be hospitalized with COVID. In just the last week, pediatric cases climbing to 94,000 and children with COVID are going into hospitals at a rate nearly four times higher than just a month ago. The Delta surge prompting the American Academy of Pediatrics to call on the FDA to authorize vaccines for 5 to 11-year-olds as fast as possible. The first phase of R. Kelly's sex trafficking trial are underway today, with jury selection beginning in New York City. The singer has denied the charges and pled not guilty. He is accused of leading employees to recruit women and girls for sex. His lawyers allege the victims are, quote, groupies that only started accusing him of abuse when public sentiment changed in the Me Too era. Kelly has been imprisoned since being indicted and was moved to Brooklyn to face trial. He has also denied sex-related charges in Illinois and Minnesota. Canada is opening its border to American visitors for the first time since the pandemic began. To enter, you'll have to provide proof of vaccination, a pre-entry negative COVID-19 test within 72 hours, and complete a laundry list of information requested on the Canadian government's ArriveCan app. With COVID-19 ravaging Canada's tourism industry, locals are wasting no time rolling out the red carpet to their neighbors to the south. 50% of our clientele is from the American tourists. I just want them like to be welcome. American visitors fell 87% from 15 million in 2019 to 1.9 million in 2020. And now that the border is open, Montrealers are happy to remind Americans that the best bagels are in fact theirs. Everything is handmade. Everything you see, you want to see is what you get. Let me see your best moose impression. Watch as water rushes into this elevator, quickly rising around a group of riders. The flooding triggered by a storm in Omaha, Nebraska. Once I got down to start trying to open the door, then it was to my neck. The group calling 911 and Lou's roommates. Those roommates coming to the rescue, helping Lou and his friends pry open the door. The water so high, they had to swim out. We just got open and then started swimming out. And then once I got out, I just couldn't believe, like, wow, this, this is something you see in a movie. Tonight, the CDC alerting doctors, be on the lookout for a very rare bacterial disease, melioidosis. Four cases identified in different states, and two patients have died. CDC officials warning of bacterial infections that may not respond to normal antibiotics. Some underlying medical conditions can increase the risk of serious infection. homecoming in St. Paul, Minnesota for gold medalist Sunisa Lee. I just hope that everyone knows that everyone's so proud of her. The first Hmong American to compete and medal at the Olympics. Her community welcoming her back this past weekend. It's exciting to have a hometown hero again, you know? I don't know, I'm 
crying. It's so exciting. <laughs> and she's just starting her first year of college at Auburn University on Wednesday. I'm an Olympic gold medalist. Like it just. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We now turn to a new Netflix documentary examining conversion therapy, the practice of using psychological and physical tactics to force LGBTQ individuals to change their sexual preference, something that has long been discredited but still remains legal in some form in 30 states. The documentary is called Pray Away. It follows both its former leaders as well as survivors. Take a look. My whole entire life was structured around not being gay. There's a high population of youth who are at Living Hope. It was at least 50 people that were cycling through. We weren't allowed to have outside contact with each other, so we weren't allowed to be friends on Facebook or to know each other's last names. The reason that we couldn't share any identifying information was because they were worried we would all meet up and have sex with each other. We were only allowed to talk when we were like supervised. That was the voice of Julie Rogers, who just heard from. She joins us now, along with Pray Away director Christine Stalakis. Welcome to the show. Both of you appreciate you talking with us. Thank it, you for having us. It, it, Julie, you were forced into conversion therapy after you came out to your parents at 16 years old. Describe what that was like for you. Yeah, I came out when I was 16 years old on Valentine's Day, and um, my parents both told me they loved me, and I I knew um, that my mom was completely devastated, and there was a clear sense for my family, like, the only option was for me to try to live, like, a straight-ish life. So the next week when my mom pulled me out of school and took me to meet with Ricky Chalette, the executive director of Living Hope Ministries in Arlington, Texas, um, I felt like it was really the only option I had. It was the only path for me to make my parents proud, to find approval in my community, and um, to be good. And so you went willingly, thinking perhaps I'll be able to get rid of this desire that I have, I'm, I'm assuming there. Give us a sense of then what happened once you went to, to this religious facility in order to try to, to rid yourself of, of being gay. So I did go willingly. I think at the age of 16, it's questionable um, because you're exclusively reliant on your on your parents for survival. But I um, I met weekly with Ricky Shillette for counseling, and then I went to a weekly support group that functioned kind of like church youth group meets a 12 step program where we would all go around the circle and sort of confess any sort of like sexual falls that we had that week, any feelings that we had for uh, crushes at school things like that. And then I went to youth retreats in the winter, Exodus uh, International Freedom Conferences every summer. And basically, um, at one point, I, I lived in a live-in home. They had all of my life and the lives of many, many hundreds of youth that I knew were almost entirely structured around trying not to be gay. And Christine, I'd like to bring you in here. Your interest in conversion therapy comes from a personal place. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so my uncle actually was sent to conversion therapy after he came out as trans as a child. And what followed was a life of tremendous mental health challenges that includes addiction, depression, suicidal ideation, tremendous anxiety, um, the list is long. Uh, this is very common for people that go through something like this. And he actually passed away a few weeks before I went to film school. And I decided that I wanted my first feature documentary to be about the Pray the Gay Away movement and the conversion therapy movement. And when I started doing research, what really struck me is that the vast majority of people who lead these movements are actually LGBTQ themselves. They're people who say that they know how to change and that they want to teach others to do the same. And for me, that really helped me understand the depth of my uncle's desperation and hope that change was possible. And of course, his devastation when change never came. Um, and then over time, as we made the film, we weaved and Julie's story as well, who primarily experienced uh, the movement as a survivor, um, to really ground the film in the undeniable harm and trauma in the movement. Because regardless of this not working, which it doesn't, the, the truth of the movement is that it causes pain and trauma. That is undeniable.
And, and according to studies by the UCLA Williams Institute, Christine, more than 700,000 LGBTQ people have gone through conversion therapy. What are the consequences that make it harmful to, to so many who go through it? Mm. Well, if I can just pause on that number for a second um, and say that that number floored me in my own research. And I'd also like to say that conversion therapy continues on every major continent. So this is a very present tense issue. Um, so many of the things I touched on in terms of what my uncle struggled through are the um, impacts of this movement. It is pain and trauma uh, made manifest. There's um, physical effects as well. That's something that we talk about in the film is the prevalence of self-harm and devastatingly suicide in this movement, which is a, you know, sad, horrible, logical conclusion of being taught to hate yourself. There's so many ways in which this harms individuals, it harms families, um, you know, the list is long, but the pain is undeniable. And Julie, I'd like to come back to you just to get a sense. Have you ever known anybody who said that it worked? I'm changed and now I'm heterosexual and, and that and, and on top of, I'm also curious if you were able to recover from the trauma that you experienced. So I'm connected to hundreds of people, probably over a thousand people who went through the programs and 98% of those people are just like, have accepted themselves as some version of queer and are living that out now, whether in religious communities or not. Um, there's a tiny, tiny percentage of people who claim that despite their ongoing struggle with same sex attractions, they have married somebody of the opposite sex and they're trying to live a life that they believe their that their Christian community tells them they have to live in order to be accepted. So, uh, but most of them don't claim that they were healed. That tiny percentage of people just say like they're they're struggling through their sexuality with a spouse. Um, in terms of healing, you know, I I myself struggled with a lot of self harm, and um, you know, the statistics uh, show that the youth who are subjected to conversion therapy are twice as likely to have attempted suicide in the last year. It's the, the consequences of this are devastating. And I have I have found that healing, you know, because of so much of this happened in relationships where we were rejected, uh, where we were told explicitly that we weren't wanted if we told the whole truth about ourselves. Um, healing for me has looked like finding communities of people who say, we see you, we love you, and we absolutely delight in you exactly the way you are. And um, and to, to find that, that there are many, many, thousands of people, tons of communities, even faith communities uh, who, who will choose me and where I know that I'm truly wanted. And Julie, last question to you. What, what do you hope that people will take away from watching Pray Away? I want them to know, first of all, that conversion therapy is continuing to happen. It's the primary response to people who come out in evangelical communities. And white, evangel white evangelicals make up a quarter of the voting bloc in the United States. So this is an enormous, uh, like a huge percent of the population. And, you know, Living Hope Ministries, Ricky Shillette, uh, they're still going. They're thriving in these communities. And uh, he's speaking in megachurches to tens of thousands of people, telling them that the right thing to do when a queer co kid comes out, that God's response is for them to reject them. And so I want them to stop doing that. And I want straight folks in those communities to, to go to their pastors and say, hey, if we are supporting this in any way, something that leads to double the suicide rates, uh, then we're gonna pull our funding and we're gonna go worship elsewhere. Kids deserve to know that they can be seen and safe and loved uh, by, by everyone in their communities. They deserve to feel safe at home. And, and so I want, I want the people practicing conversion therapy to stop. And I want the queer people in those communities to know that there are, there are so many people that will welcome them and delight in them enthusiastically, exactly because they are who they are, that this world is more beautiful because they're in it. Julie Rogers, Christine Stalakis, we thank you so much for joining us. Pray Away, which is executive produced by Ryan Murphy and Jason Blum is available now on Netflix. The Living Hope Ministries declined to comment to the filmmakers nor provide anyone for an interview. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Olympians are heading home and in this case providing some extraordinary sights at the airport. Olympian Evita Griskinis of Team USA's rhythmic gymnastic team decided to pose for the cameras in Tokyo's airport. Don't try that at home or do if you're extremely flexible. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
of the next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including the growing concerns about the risk the Delta variant poses to children. And why is the cleanliness of celebrities like Ashton Kutcher and others becoming a thing? Stay with us. Here at ABC News at this hour, tributes have been coming in for the young Chicago police officer killed in the line of duty. 29-year-old Ella French was shot and killed during a routine traffic stop. Her partner is now fighting for his life as flags fly and half staff in the city in her honor. Three suspects are now in custody in connection with that violence. In battle, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's top aide has resigned. This is state lawmakers in that city discuss possible impeachment proceedings following the blistering attorney general's report that accused him last week of sexual harassment involving 11 women. Governor Cuomo, who has maintained he has never touched anyone inappropriately, is also facing misdemeanor charges in Albany stemming from a criminal complaint filed by his former executive assistant. And some welcome news on the economy front for many. For the first time ever, supermarket and restaurant workers are now earning more than $15 an hour. Both groups have seen their wages rise more than 7% from pre-pandemic levels and a reminder there are record 10 million jobs available nationwide and as the economy recovers it still has to grapple with a pandemic and the delta variant that continues to infect more people the number of americans in the hospital right now with covid continues to grow at an alarming rate jumping more than 300 percent since early july the vast majority of these people are unvaccinated all this coming as one doctor is describing the upcoming school year as a humanitarian catastrophe victor kendo has more Tonight, the COVID crisis is exploding across the South. From Florida to Louisiana to Texas, hospitals are putting up surge tents, bringing in extra ventilators and running out of beds and staff. When you overrun us and you wear us down and we get to where we can't come to work anymore, that's not gonna be anybody here to take care of you. With 68,000 COVID patients straining American hospitals, experts warn the system in affected communities is nearing the breaking point. If this pace continues for the next four or five days, uh, which it seems it will, the hospital systems in Florida and Louisiana will collapse. And with COVID infections climbing, another move to mandate vaccines. The Pentagon today announcing it will seek the president's approval to require nearly 1.4 million active duty military members to get the vaccine starting in mid-September. You can consider this memo today as what we would call in the military a warning order. And the Pentagon could move that deadline up if the vaccines get full FDA approval sooner. Tonight, with millions of school children heading back to the classroom, doctors fear more kids will be hospitalized with COVID. You should assume that we're going to see uh, pediatric intensive care units all across the South completely overwhelmed and something even a possibility of uh, tent, small tent cities of, of sick adolescents and kids. In just the last week, pediatric cases climbing to 94,000 and children with COVID are going into hospitals at a rate nearly four times higher than just a month ago. This is not your grandfather's COVID. Children are experiencing more d severe disease than they have in the past. They come in in respiratory failure. They often require hospitalization in the pediatric intensive care unit. The Delta surge prompting the American Academy of Pediatrics to call on the FDA to authorize vaccines for 5 to 11-year-olds as fast as possible. In Virginia, 17-year-old Shwanda Corpru died just four days before she was scheduled to get the vaccine. I don't want to see anybody else have to bury, you know, their little sibling or little daughter or anything like that. It's really heartbreaking. In Jacksonville, Florida, 12-year-old Lila Hartley wants masks in schools to protect her 10-year-old brother who's too young to get the vaccine. Even though I'm vaccinated, I can still get sick. Also, my, my younger brother will... I don't want to get him sick if I get it because I wasn't wearing a mask. Lots of concern for the young, too young to get vaccinated. Our thanks to Victor for that. And for more on all this, let's bring in Dr. John Brownstein, epidemiologist and chief innovation officer at Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Brownstein, thank you as always for, for joining us. Let's just start out with the, the idea that the American Academy of Pediatrics found that nearly 94,000 new COVID cases among kids were reported last week and the rate of hospitalizations is the highest it's been since the start of the pandemic. With the start of school, either here here in some areas or, or quickly approaching in others. What concerns you the most right now? 
Yeah, good, good evening, Lindsay. I am very concerned about this rapid exponential rise in kids. It's something that we haven't seen throughout this pandemic. It's the most significant increase that we've seen since the beginning of COVID. And the rate of hospitalizations is especially concerning, about four times higher than it was a month ago. And so this is as bad as we've seen, and especially in states like Florida and Texas, we have this real concern because we have our unv unvaccinated pediatric population that is vulnerable to Delta. And this is why it's so important for the adults around them to be vaccinated. And yes, we've had trouble getting people to get the shot. You know, we of course know that children don't get as seriously ill with COVID, but some do and some will die, unfortunately. And we have this concern, of course, of long COVID. And so while there's no definitive data that Delta is more severe, just having this level of transmission in the community means we're going to see more kids get sick. And so for that reason, unfortunately, you know, the pressure is going to be on for kids to mask and, and be protected as much as possible in all these communities where we're seeing such incredible amount of spread happening. And you just mentioned the importance of children masking up. I assume that's going to be how you answer my next question as far as the best way to keep children protected as they start going back to school, especially talking about those who are who are under the age of 12 and not yet eligible to get vaccinated. Yeah, so of course masking is part of it. It's gonna be about layers of protection. Like we've said throughout the past year, this is about you know additional levels of intervention to keep our kids safe. So yes, masking, cloth masks maybe, but even better quality masks like KN95 masks, social distancing or potting. So the idea that you know we may not want to have our kids in large assemblies or lunch rooms. We've got to improve the ventilation in our schools, and that can even be done cheaply through portable air filters or opening windows. Testing, we have lots of testing capacity right now, and weekly pool testing or even rapid testing to, to make sure we identify cases as early as possible. And then vaccines, yes, our younger kids are not eligible, but the adults in those schools can get vaccinated. Those over 12 and over can get vaccinated. So we have a lot of tools that are disposable, and you know we're gonna see surges in communities. And so it's gonna be on, on unfortunately on schools to figure out how to layer all these interventions together to make sure that we can keep our kids safe and really in school for the duration of the year. And today the AAP also urged the FDA to approve the vaccine for five to 11 year olds as soon as possible. When do you think that we could see that happen and why is that so delayed? Yes, I understand. People are very anxious right now. I have, you know, a 10 and 11 year old. I'd love to see them vaccinated. And we have the Delta variant. But the FDA has yet to receive data from Pfizer or Moderna. You know, those trials are ongoing. Pfizer said it will have two months of safety data heading into September. And then we'll submit for that authorization shortly after. Similarly for Moderna, should be mid-fall. We have to remember, the, the FDA is really requesting, you know, additional data on our kids because we want to make sure we're doing the right thing for our kids, making sure that the safety profile of these vaccines are what we expect them to be safe and effective, but the FDA needs to take its time. And, you know, of course, once that data is in, we don't know exactly how long FDA will, will take to authorize, but it should be pretty quick. And FDA is going to remain nimble. If we see this rapid rise in kids, that will put the pressure on in terms of emergency authorization. And, you know, so the FDA will make decisions as more data comes in. But we have to remember the risk calculation for our kids is different. We know they don't get as severely ill. And we want to make sure that, you know, the safety profile for these vaccines are good so that we're giving our kids the right vaccines. And also on top of that, we know there's a lot of hesitancy out there in the population. So we want to counter that. So putting you on the spot here, are you thinking maybe October, November, most likely for that age group? Exactly. I'm thinking, you know, October, November, by Thanksgiving, we will, we will see that age group getting the vaccine. And what about kids who are younger than five? Right, so those trials are still ongoing as well. I think that you know the FDA may require a longer safety uh, data period, so that could be four to six months. And so, but it will be highly dependent on the data we see in that in that older age group. If we see that the vaccines are effective but primarily safe, then I think we'll see quickly the expansion to that younger age group. What do you most want to communicate to people who are still hesitant, reluctant to get vaccinated? You know, the, the biggest challenge now is communicating that these vaccines are working, right? We, we know we hear talk about breakthrough cases, but these vaccines are doing an incredible job to keep people out of hospitals and keep people from dying. And so we have to remember that the vaccines are working against what we want, which is severe illness. And so, you know, we also have to remember this surge could be incredibly worse. This summer, you know, the numbers of deaths we're seeing is great. It could be much greater if it wasn't for the vaccine. So if you're a person that's on the fence right now, there's a real urgency. You know, the more individuals we can get vaccinated, the more we can bring this pandemic to a close. And, you know, the more that we can get increase that vaccination, 
the, the less you know, chances we're going to see that fall surge that we're all concerned about. Dr. John Brownstein, thank you so much. Very helpful insight. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to that dire warning from the United Nations tonight, the code red for humanity. The new climate report out today painting a dire picture of what the future may look like. This comes as firefighters around the world are dealing with fires on a nearly unprecedented scope. Our Zareen Shah reports in from the fire lines in California. Tonight, as California's second largest fire on record rages, a shocking new UN report warning the effects of climate change are getting worse, warming Earth at a faster rate than previously thought. It's indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events like heat waves, droughts, and uh, heavy rainfall more frequent and severe. The U.N. Secretary General with that code red for humanity warning. More than 230 experts from 66 nations now urging a rapid reduction in greenhouse gases. They now predict the planet will rise an average of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit by 2040. Less than 20 years from now and a decade before they initially believed. Bringing with that more heat waves, droughts and fires. Fires love a few things. They love heat. They love dry. They love wind. California's Dixie Fire now scorching nearly half a million acres. This fire has been burning for about a month and it's still nowhere near contained. It is still ripping through this forest. Incinerating the town of Greenville last week. The surrounding areas still threatened. The air difficult to breathe because of the multiple hazards. Officials say it could be weeks before families are allowed to return. Robert Johns among those losing homes now unsure of what's next. It's just uh hard to realize it's all gone now at this point. Just so much devastation there. Zareen Shaw joins us now from the midst of the rubble there in Greenville, California. Is Zareen, any relief in sight? Yeah, Lindsay, first I want to tell you about what we're seeing behind me. This, what you're seeing, is what every block in this town looks like. Many of these buildings have been here since the mid-1800s. They have just been brought to the ground, and there is no relief inside. There is more record heat that's possible in parts of the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. Triple-digit heat by midweek combined with bone-dry conditions, just already adding to that already devastating fire season. Lindsay? Zoreen, thank you. Next to the breaking news involving Prince Andrew, he is now facing a new lawsuit filed by Jeffrey Epstein's accuser, Virginia Jufre. Here's ABC's Janae Norman. Tonight, Prince Andrew facing a new lawsuit filed by Jeffrey Epstein accuser Virginia Roberts Jufre, claiming the prince sexually abused her when she was 17. In the lawsuit, Jufre stating, 20 years ago, Prince Andrew's wealth, power, position, and connections enabled him to abuse a frightened, vulnerable child with no one there to protect her. Regardless of how rich and powerful they may be, they are not above the law. In court filings beginning in 2014, Jufre says Epstein and longtime associate Ghislaine Maxwell allegedly directed her to have sex with Prince Andrew on three occasions in 2001. Included in the filings, this photograph of Jufre standing beside the prince. In a rare interview with the BBC in November 2019, the prince denied her accusations. You don't remember meeting her? No. Nobody can prove uh, whether or not it, um, that, it, that photograph has been doctored, but I don't recollect that photograph ever being taken. The filing comes nearly two years after Epstein died in a New York jail. Andrew has not commented on the filing today. And as for Ghislaine Maxwell, she has pleaded not guilty to federal charges. She conspired with Epstein and aided in his alleged sexual abuse of four underage girls from 1994 to 2004. Her trial is set to begin in November. Lindsay. Janae, thank you. It has been nearly a year and a half since Americans have been able to visit Canada without having to quarantine. But now there are some steps that visitors can take that include being fully vaccinated in order to see our neighbors to the north. Will Reeve reports from Montreal with the new rules before you make the trip. Canada is opening its border to American visitors for the first time since the pandemic began. Bienvenue à Montréal. To enter, you'll have to provide proof of vaccination, a pre-entry negative COVID-19 test within 72 hours, and complete a laundry list of information requested on the Canadian government's ArriveCan app. 
I do think people that will be vaccinated and able to come into Canada as quickly as possible. With COVID-19 ravaging Canada's tourism industry, locals are wasting no time rolling out the red carpet to their neighbors to the south. 50% of our clientele is from the American tourists. I just want them like to be welcome. American visitors fell 87% from 15 million in 2019 to 1.9 million in 2020. The economy losing $11 billion in the process. We're ready to welcome uh, with open arms our, uh, our American friends. But now a glimmer of hope. Nearly 60% of Canadians are fully vaccinated and over 71% have had at least one dose. Canadians are saying Americans can feel safe here. In every corner of this great country, there are sights to soak in. From Toronto's towering skyscrapers to the spectacular shorefronts of Quebec. Here in Montreal, small boutiques and eateries line the cobblestone streets, creating a sort of Parisian ambiance as spectators gather in the parks and along the water to watch artists perform. Canada's cruising industry also hoping for smooth waters ahead this November when the cruise ban is expected to lift, allowing popular cruises to Alaska to set sail. Canada is looking to have next year's Alaska season the same as it was before. Our thanks to Will Reeve for that. Still to come, the Taliban gaining ground three weeks before the U.S. completes its withdrawal. And the fuss about taking a bath. We'll explain. Welcome back. The Taliban has gained ground three weeks before the U.S. completes its withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. In just days, the group has seized control of six key cities. Even the Pentagon says things are, quote, clearly not headed in the right direction. Stephanie Ramos has more. Tonight, the situation in Afghanistan deteriorating quickly. The Taliban taking control of two more provincial capitals just today, bringing the total to six. The Afghan Ministry of Defense releasing video of airstrikes against Taliban positions. But the Taliban's takeover has been swift. In just the past five months, the group seizing wide swaths of the country. And now, a growing humanitarian crisis for Afghan children. At least 27 killed and 136 injured since Friday. The Pentagon saying today the situation is clearly not going in the right direction. However, the secretary continues to believe uh, that the Afghan forces have the capability, they have the capacity to make a big difference on the battlefield. With the full U.S. withdrawal just weeks away, the Afghan government clearly struggling to make that difference. Lindsay, the U.S. military says 95% of U.S. troops and equipment have withdrawn, and the withdrawal will continue the next few weeks ahead. However, about 650 U.S. troops will remain on the ground to help protect the U.S. Embassy and the airport. The U.S. is also providing critical air support to Afghan forces. That is scheduled to end later this month. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. We're tracking several more international headlines at this hour. It's not just America, as you well know, dealing with the historic fires on the Greek tourist island of Evia. Helicopters were attacking the flames from above. The island was cut in half by out of control infernos over the weekend. This is parts of Europe are seeing the worst heat in 30 years. And France has taken the leap. They're now requiring people to show proof of a COVID vaccination before they can enjoy restaurants and cafes across the country. The measure is in part an effort to get more people vaccinated, but it's not without controversy. There were several protests this weekend leading up to today. And after 17 months, a herd of roaming elephants that have captivated the attention of so many in China, it's believed that they're now returning to their original habitat. According to state media, more than 150,000 residents have been evacuated and 25,000 officers have been deployed alongside drones to guide the migrating animals. Animals. Rodeos are a huge part of the culture in the American West, particularly in states like Idaho, but like so much, COVID disrupted that too. But as Kana Whitworth reports, they are making a comeback. The rodeo is back. Hundreds have been canceled across the West because of COVID, but here in Idaho, the tradition remains strong. The rodeo here is a real bedrock for the community. Yes, we've been over 100 years producing this rodeo, so it's a, a legend, I guess, in Cambridge. I mean, if, <laughs> if we didn't have the rodeo, what would we do in the first week of August every year, yeah. you know? 
The Cambridge Rodeo is a homecoming for the small community. Cowboys and cowgirls traveling from all over the West to compete. Before I could even think about going, I had a few things to get done. First, outfit change. It's time to get rodeo ready, and I know just the place. Idaho's Cowboy Supply Company in business for more than 40 years, run by 85-year-old Molly Manchaka, who tells you like it is. That's a no-no out west. If they're not comfortable when you start out, they're not gonna be comfortable when you finish. You know your jeans, pushing them inside your boots, have your boot tops outside. A real cowboy would Real do cowboys that. don't do that. Just show off for wannabes. Great. Don't do that in Idaho. Mission accomplished. We are ready. Looking the part is one thing, but competing in a rodeo, that takes dedication. 25-year-old Sky Wilson, owner of Yahoo Corrals, is thrilled to be back in the saddle. Hello! Hi! <laughs> it's great to see you. Oh, and this is Sedona? Yes. What do you want to say to somebody who's maybe never ridden a horse before? Horses is a great way to socially distance. I mean, when they're nose to tail, you're still at least six feet apart. Yeah, and There's you're outside. Great family. Yeah, open air, people loved it. Her business, taking many a first-time rider through the mountains of Idaho, saw a major boom during the pandemic. We couldn't imagine having a better summer than last year, and we've absolutely buried it. We've even got more staff and horses, and it still feels like we don't have enough half the time. Sky's also a barrel racer, riding her horse Sedona in Cambridge. For many families, though, it's more than the bright lights of the arena. It's a celebration of their Western heritage and upholding it for the next generation. What does it mean to you to see your son take that ranch over? Pretty special. Yeah. Because yeah. not all kids want to do it. Because there's a lot of kids that leave home and they see those high paying dollar jobs. This is a passion. It's not about the money, it's about the lifestyle, how to raise your kids, especially in a community like this. Our thanks to Kena for that. And finally tonight, it's all about coming clean, about getting clean. Why are so many celebrities feeling the need to share their bathing habits? Will Gans has more. The Rock is coming clean. Whoa, whoa. Revealing that he showers three times a day. Careful, they can smell fear. The Jungle Crew star tweeting that he starts his day with a cold shower, takes a warm one after he works out, and a hot shower when he gets home from work. If you're someone like The Rock who probably exercises uh, multiple times a day, you're sweating more, your skin bacteria feeds off of that sweat, then it's probably a good idea for you to wash uh, more often. The Rock saying, I'm the opposite of a not washing themselves celeb, following a slew of stars revealing they don't bathe with soap and water every day. Like Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher on a recent episode of the Armchair Expert podcast. I don't wash my body with soap every day. I yes. wash my armpits and my crotch daily and nothing yes. else ever. For people who have more sensitive skin, totally reasonable just to use water. Um, you want some of that oil to build up on your skin. Kristen Bell and Dak Shepard appearing on The View, saying that they don't wash their kids every day. I'm a big fan of waiting for the steak. Okay, Once you catch a whiff, that's, that's biology's way of letting you know you need to clean it up. It's There's a red flag. She strikes on something that is actually sound. I tend to maybe recommend before the, the sniff test is positive, just because you're probably playing catch up. And Jake Gyllenhaal revealing in a new interview with Vanity Fair, more and more I find bathing to be less necessary at times. I do also think that there's a whole world of not bathing that is also really helpful for skin maintenance. And we naturally clean ourselves. And how often should we really be taking a shower? Good question. You have to know your skin. Well, as long as you're not causing your skin undue harm by not bathing on a regular schedule or on a daily basis, then, and the people around you don't mind the stink, you know, you do you. Hollywood airing their dirty laundry there. Our thanks to Will for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.